Live from the Christian Research Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina, you're listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff. We're on the air because life and truth matter. Our mission is to equip you in truth with sound biblical teaching and spiritual discernment as a foundation for experiencing the authentic Christian life through fellowship with God and Christ. To join us on air with your question, dial 888-ASK-HANK, which translates to 888-275-4265. For more information, go online to equip.org. And now, here's your host, Hank Hanegraaff. And thank you very much, Randy. You can also contact us via the mail at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Uh, the resource of the month, we've been talking about it for the last couple of days. I won't say a lot about it on today's broadcast, but do check it out on the web at equip.org. The title of the book, Free to Believe, The Battle of a Religious Liberty in America by Luke Goodrich. It's an absolute must. In fact, I'm putting up a video at equip.org, which sort of explains why I'm excited about this book. That'll be up shortly. Also... Uh, there's a particular issue that I read about in USA Today by Doyle Rice, and this issue was so good that I'm going to talk about it right now, and we're going to put up a, uh, a Bible Answer Man YouTube video in the very near future based on what I'm saying today. Anyway, this article is about Neanderthals, uh, and it says they didn't just hunt mammoths, Researchers now say they knew how to fish. And so the article goes on to dispel the fervently held notion that Neanderthals were, you know, these club-wielding brutes. Instead, now it is believed that they were skilled fishermen whose seafood diet increased their, well, their cognitive ability and boosted their aptitude for abstract thought. So... Instead of being half-naked, primitive animals roaming through northern Europe, hunting for mammoths with uh, these inefficient weapons, the peer-reviewed journal Science now is concluding that the real uh, Neanderthal is a sophisticated southern European fisherman whose evolution was profoundly aided by, guess what, the ingestion of fish oils. So as it turns out, Neanderthals were human beings after all, something I've been saying on the Bible Answer Man broadcast for over 30 years. And what we find out is once again, what has long been touted as settled science turns out to be not so settled at all. This, of course, should not surprise anyone in the least. I say that because scientific academics are hardly impervious to groupthink. And that's particularly true when tenure, when group dynamics, and when grants are in play. And you would be hard-pressed to come up with a better case of herd mentality in the settled science community than their stampede-like embrace of the science of eugenics. If you think back, you will recall that eugenics was once standard fare in high school biology textbooks. And so perhaps you, like many others, will remember one classic biology textbook in particular. George William Hunter's A Civic Biology. Now that text would probably not be as etched on our collective memories were it not for Inherit the Wind, you know, the infamous movie starring Spencer Tracy and Gene Kelly, that movie has now been seen by multiplied millions over many, many years, and of course features the 1925 Scopes trial in which John Scopes is jailed because he was violating a state law prohibiting the teaching of evolution. And as a professed progenitor of progress, Scopes uses the civil biology textbook to convince his students that humanity 
has an evolutionary hierarchy. That, that if we follow the early history of man upon this earth, we find that at first he must have been little better than one of the lower animals. That at the present time, there exist upon the earth five races or varieties of man. Those five races, as uh, articulated in civic biology, are the, uh, the Negro type originating in Africa, the Malay or brown race from the islands of the Pacific, the American India, the Mongolian or yellow race includes uh, China, Japan, and Eskimos, and then highest of them all, the Caucasians, which are represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Now, the text goes on to make this stirring case for the pseudoscience of eugenics and goes so far as to say, I mean, this is being taught to young children, goes so far as to say that the remedy for those not well born should be, I hardly dare get the word out of my mouth, but this is what the text says, extermination. You got to get rid of them because otherwise their genes would affect the genes of other people and evolution wouldn't take place. Well, of course, apart from ongoing reparations, eugenics has largely faded into the shadowy recesses of history. But the evolutionary dogma that birthed it is as virulent today as it was back then. Tragic but true, Charles Darwin is yet one of the most lauded luminaries in academic institutions around the world. Even his most racist ideologies are defended with a fervency that matches that of the most socially deviant cults. And yet, and yet it was Darwin who infamously said that at some future period not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies then will be wider, he said, and it will intervene between man in a more civilized state and some ape as low as a baboon. Well, Dr. Benjamin Weicker, if I had on the Bible Answer Men broadcast many times, rightly deduced that Darwin's ranking of races places the Caucasian at the top and then down at the bottom, dangling at the edge of humanity, you had the Negro or the Australian who is just an evolutionary hair breath away from the anthropomorphous gorilla. It is more than sad to see the lengths to which credentialed scientists have stretched to prop up the decaying corpse of evolution. I love what Dr. Berlinski said in this regard. I have uh, I've quoted it before, it bears repeating. Berlinski said, Darwin's theory of evolution is the last of the great 19th century mystery religions. And as we speak, is now following Freudianism and Marxism into the nether regions. And I'm quite sure, he said, that Freud, Marx, and Darwin are commiserating one with another in the dark dungeon where discarded gods gather. How insightful, how true, how poignant, how profound. And while insiders in the evolutionary community are well aware of their theory's desperate condition, the general public is as yet in the dark. Hard to imagine, but it happens to be true. And that is precisely where you and I come in. We have the privilege, the privilege to share the news that nothing could be more compelling in an age of scientific enlightenment than in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Sometimes I think, the theory of evolution is going to die an early death. And I keep waiting for that to happen. 
And I'm always surprised when I pick up the newspaper, as I did this week, and I find articles like this that underscore a fervency in belief with respect to the evolutionary dogma, which ultimately postulates a gradation of races. How different the Bible. In the Bible were created in the Imago Dei in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, we don't make gradations, distinctions based on skin color or eye color or one person being higher or lower than the other. Coming to a station break, we'll go to your calls on this side of the break, Triple Eight Ask Hank. Many Americans are concerned about religious freedom, feeling the culture changing around them and fearing that their Christian beliefs will soon be viewed as bigotry. In Free to Believe, Luke Goodrich offers a balanced gospel-centered approach to religious freedom, applying biblical understanding to critical cultural issues of our day while offering practical steps Christians can take to respond to religious freedom conflicts. To receive your copy of Free to Believe, The Battle Over Religious Liberty in America, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit us at equip.org. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with more answers from the Bible Answer Man. Are you the product of millions of years of unguided, purposeless, natural processes? Or are you created in the image of a loving God? Faced with the overwhelming scorn of evolutionary proselytizers, it can be hard to articulate the truth about God's creative work. And even among faithful Christians, many misconceptions linger. The Creation Answer Book by Hank Hanegraaff puts answers to the most hotly debated origins questions right at your fingertips, giving you clarity and understanding. Learn to articulate the truth about our origins clearly and compassionately when you request your copy of the Creation Answer Book or listen to Hank's insightful answers with the unabridged audiobook version on CD. Receive your copy of the Creation Answer Book or the audiobook on CD from the Christian Research Institute when you call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Many Americans feel their religious freedom is under attack. They see the culture changing and fear their beliefs will soon be punished as a form of bigotry. Others think these fears are overblown and say Christians should stop complaining about imaginary persecution. In Free to Believe, leading religious freedom attorney Luke Goodrich combines frontline experience with faithful attention to scripture to show why religious freedom matters, how it is threatened, and how to protect it. With penetrating insights on gay rights, abortion, Islam, and the public square, Goodrich argues that threats to religious freedom are real, but they might not be quite what you think. To receive your copy of Free to Believe, The Battle Over Religious Liberty in America, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us at equip.org. The Christian Research Journal is CRI's award-winning magazine, combining eye-catching design with well-researched articles that equip you to exercise truth and experience life. Here's what's in the current special double issue of the Christian Research Journal. Because questions remain about the earliest moments of the universe, scientists offer speculative alternatives to our universe having an actual beginning. Nevertheless, the science that is known to be true provides abundant evidence that the universe came into being a finite time ago, just as the Bible teaches. Other topics include how Dante's Inferno can help explain hell to modern seekers, Christian apologetics in a nutshell, John Chrysostom, the Golden Mouth Preacher, Christian imagination and the problem of horrendous evil, and much, much more. Start your subscription to the Christian Research Journal today by calling 888-7000-CRI, 888-7000-CRI, or subscribe online at equip.org. That's equip.org.
Let's return to your host, Hank Hanegraaff. And thank you very much, Randy. Let's go to the phone lines. The number to dial, triple eight, ask Hank, numerically triple eight two seven five forty two sixty five. Clint in North Dakota, listening on Sirius XM one thirty one. Hi, Clint. Hi, Hank. Thanks for taking my call. Pleasure. Uh, I was talking to a guy. Uh, he he said we have no historical proof that Jesus ever existed, and I mentioned that um, Tacitus, the Roman historian, had mentioned him. I also mentioned Josephus that he had mentioned him, and the guy he said, "Well, we have we don't have the originals. We don't have any originals of the Josephus works or Tacitus's works." He said it, it, they just date from the Renaissance, and I went and looked it up, and it, he, the guy was right. He also said that that uh, the guy by the name of Joe Atwell had written a book called Caesar's Messiah, and he said that. It was just part of a plot, to, a Roman plot, to create a pacifist Jewish Messiah. And of course, I believe in Jesus, and, and I don't believe that. But I just wondered what your answer to that would be. You know that that that, they, that we don't have the original manuscripts of, of Josephus and Tacitus. So what we what you would say to that? Well, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I'm glad you looked it up and checked it out because you go to affirm what you have to affirm. Uh, so it is true that if you look at the uh, manuscript evidence for Tacitus, we have two manuscripts, I think. One dates somewhere uh, to uh, AD 850 and the other the middle of the 11th century. Uh, there's a lot more manuscript evidence for Josephus. But the, the point is that very few people that I know of uh, particularly in our epoch of time, deny that Tacitus was one of the great uh, historians of the Roman Empire, uh, nor do people deny the historicity of Josephus. Uh, we, we know when he was born. We know that uh, he was a contemporary of those who lived at the time of Jesus. He was born just after the death of Jesus, if I recall correctly. I think it was AD 37. Um, but at any rate, uh, no one doubts these are, are, are genuine historians, uh, one a Roman historian, the other a Jewish historian. And by the way, you can also acknowledge the fact that uh, the Bible uh, is buttressed by lots of manuscript evidence, but we don't have the autographer. The point is that we have so many manuscripts that we can get back to the autographs and be convinced that what we have uh, properly represents uh, what was in the original writings themselves. Uh, so, so the idea that Jesus is historical fiction, uh, that Tacitus is not real or Josephus is not real, is not not held by many credible historians today. In fact, you think about the death of Jesus Christ, the fatal suffering of Jesus Christ. That is now acknowledged not only in the spiritual community, but it is acknowledged broadly within the secular uh, community as well. So uh, at one time, there were people who would say the fatal torment of Jesus Christ was mythology, Rare to find someone that would have the temerity, the reckless boldness to say something that outrageous today. Oh, thank you. That, that's, a, that's a good answer. I, I just wanted to hear what you had to say about that because, you know, there's a lot of online, you, you get a lot of people that just, they come up with these, you know, very intelligent sounding answers and you you, you try to, try to give every man an answer, the right answer, you know, divide the Word of God severally, and and, and uh, I, I just didn't want to appear like I didn't know what I was talking about with the guy, you know. Yeah, well, let me, uh, and this is for you, but for the broader audience as well, let me give you just a little bit of information here that might be helpful. And, and, and some of this summarizes what I just said in terms of a thumbnail sketch. But first, the sheer volume of papyrus and parchment that undergirds sacred scripture dwarfs that of any other work in classical history. And that includes Josephus and Tacitus, of course. We now have an excess of 
uh, somewhere around 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. And not only is there a relatively short time interval between the earliest papyrus and parchment copies of the New Testament and their autographs, but there's less than a generation between the autographs and the events they chronicle. So what's the point? The point is that the quality and quantity of papyrus and parchment manuscripts assure us that the message and the intent of the original autographs has been passed on to the present generation without compromise. The second thing I would say, and I'm trying to relegate this to three points. The second th uh, thing is, is that there's internal evidence and uh, think about what you read in Scripture where Peter says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And of course, Dr. Luke, who wrote Acts and the Gospel of Luke, says that he gathered eyewitness testimony and he carefully investigated everything. So if internal evidence points to anything, it is to the reality that the gospel writers were inspired to faithfully narrate a core set of facts by which they had been radically transformed. And then a third point would be the external evidence, the point that you brought up as the basis of this call. On the one hand, the internal evidence is sufficient to establish the biblical manuscripts as authentic, as reliable, as complementary. In other words, they complement one another. But external evidence provides remarkable cooperating attestation. And that involves some of the things you mentioned, from early external evidence provided by credible historians... And we would say that uh, the Jewish Josephus, the Roman Tacitus, Suetonius, Plinius, and, and many others are, 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 are credible historians. But from their works, it is possible to piece together highlights of Christ in the New Testament wholly apart from the internal evidence itself. Josephus is uh, one of the best examples, and I don't think that we ought to jettison that example. He was an eyewitness to many of the details, many of the descriptions that you find in the New Testament. And of course, the most noteworthy reference to Jesus appears in his Antiquities 18. And uh, one of my co-authors of a book called The uh, Da Vinci Code, Fact or Fiction, Dr. Paul Meyer, has written a whole book which, uh, which deals in detail uh, with Josephus and his works. So uh, he's a credible authority. He's a professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, at least he was, and uh, he's, he's now retired. But, but he is a, a classic example of someone that you can trust and that has done all of the legwork. And uh, going back many years, I've had uh, Paul Meyer on the Bible Answer Man broadcast on many uh, occasions. L let me say one other thing. Even the infamous skeptic Bart Ehrman argues strenuously for the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, so he, he doesn't believe Jesus is the Son of God, but, but he does acknowledge the evidence is undeniable that Jesus existed. So again, even the most ardent skeptics of the Bible and the message of Jesus Christ, because Ehrman thought that Jesus Christ was a false apocalyptic prophet, agree that Jesus was a historical character. Thank you very much, Hank. I really appreciate that. You got it. Thank you so much for your call. And uh, you know, a couple of things that uh, are apropos to this discussion. One is the, um, the movie on DVD that we were uh, promoting all last month as our, our resource of the month that was available for those who support the ministry. Still is. I mean, you can get a copy of it. Just go to the web at equip.org. It's available for those who support the ministry of the Christian Research Institute, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, the Hank Unplugged podcast, the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel, and our 
seven outreaches around the world. It's called Can We Trust the Bible? Fragments of Truth. Check it out on the web at equip.org. Also, I wrote a book on this subject, and that's why some of this stuff is in my memory trace. It's titled, Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs for the Bible's Divine Inspiration. That also a resource available for those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. We've had an exciting week or the programs. I hope you've been blessed. It's been a blessing to be able to do them. And of course, the reason that we're able to do what we do is because there are people out there, even in the midst of the coronavirus, that stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. If you can give, this would be a great time to do that. You know, giving is down, coronavirus doesn't help. You can give in a safe, secure fashion at equip.org. What we do now has eternal significance. So give at equip.org. Thanks for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you next time or next week with more of the show. We appreciate you tuning in to the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Before we sign off today, here's our contact information. By phone, dial 888-7000-CRI, which translates to 888-7000-274. On the internet, go to equip.org. That's equip.org. You can also write CRI at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina. The zip code is 28271. Our prayer is that today's broadcast has equipped you to better defend your faith and encouraged you to pursue sound doctrine and godly living. Thank you for listening. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is supported solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because life and truth matter. Many Americans feel their religious freedom is under attack. They see the culture changing and fear their beliefs will soon be punished as a form of bigotry. Others think these fears are overblown and say Christians should stop complaining about imaginary persecution. In Free to Believe, leading religious freedom attorney Luke Goodrich combines frontline experience with faithful attention to Scripture to show why religious freedom matters, how it is threatened, and how to protect it. With penetrating insights on gay rights, abortion, Islam, and the public square, Goodrich argues that threats to religious freedom are real, but they might not be quite what you think. To receive your copy of Free to Believe, The Battle Over Religious Liberty in America, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us at equip.org.